If I told you that this here chalk talk was a mix of electron beam welding, current sense telemetry, and Ohm's law, what would you guess was the technology at the heart of this episode? If you said current sense resistors, you're right. <laughs> current sense resistors, or shunts as they are frequently referred to, can be extremely helpful when it comes to the measurement of current in a variety of electronic designs. Not only can current sense shunts help you more accurately measure current, they can also help improve system efficiency as well. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Scott Carson from Borns and I talk about the what, where, and how of current sense shunts. We explore the benefits that current sense shunts bring to battery management and EV charging systems, and explore how Borns is encouraging innovation in this arena. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Borns. Hi, Scott. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, Amelia. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. Okay, so we're talking about current sense shunts today. But before we dig into the details, what all will we be covering today? Well, we're going to go back to some circuits 101 and uh, discuss resistors, more precisely or importantly, precision resistors. We will discuss why they exist, how they are used, and then we'll dig into more details about the interesting metallurgy and tech behind making and matching these resistors. And then finally, we'll wrap up with what kind of implementation options you have and then selection considerations when building a system that requires precision resistances or resistors and the important criteria for optimizing your system with precision resistors. Okay, so first, Scott, give my audience a brief refresher on what exactly a current sense resistor is. Yeah, so, you know, going back to Circuits 101, our first day in class, we are taught that the resistors, they resist the flow of current. And, you know, the venerable analog is the water hose where you have a water flowing through a hose. You constrict the hose and that's a resistance. And so in this case, the resistor is a restriction in the circuit or the current flow. Typical resistor has a tolerance in the range of 1% to 5%. A precision resistor can be as low as a half a percent to even 0.1%. The precision resistor type is typically called a shunt and use an application to report current magnitude passing through the resistor at any given time. Okay, so what kind of options do we have for shunts for current sense resistors? Well, really, the precision resistors, they're made of different materials, typically a ceramic type of substrate wrapped in a metal or with thick film deposited on them. In the case of chip resistors, the resistances range from 5 milliohm to 40 milliohm up to as much as 5 megohm, depending on what you need. And of course, uh, you would expect like in a chip resistor, the power ratings are a little bit lower than what you would expect in a big hunk of copper and resistance material in an e-beam welded shunt. So you see that the power ratings on the chip resistors are in the 0.1 watts to up to 3 watts, and then the e-beam welded are, are much higher. But what we're doing, we're showing these different types of shunts offered by Borns and their respective construction technology. Of note is the temperature coefficient, or TCR. TCR is important as the resistance will change over temperature, and the control electronics must compensate for this variance as to keep an accurate accounting of the current passing through the shunt. Since power systems and EVs, charging infrastructure, hybrid grids, and motor controls are reaching unprecedented power levels requiring high-power shunt technologies. Okay, so as an upper-level question here, Scott, why do we need shunts? It's a great question. From day two of our Circuits 101 class, as we learned, Ohm's Law tells us that a voltage is developed when a current is passed through the resistor. And so why are shunts necessary is that they generate this voltage, and it's a very, very low-cost way to measure current passing through a circuit. There are other technologies such as current transformers or even Hall effect sensors which can do this, but they typically involve more circuitry, add additional cost to the circuit. 
But really the lowest cost, most direct way is to directly measure the current in the circuit and report that as a voltage. And so the voltage is directly proportional to the current following Ohm's law. And since the voltages are much more manageable with control circuitry, we utilize this highly precise voltage to report current magnitude and direction. So you can measure if the current is flowing in one direction or the other by the voltage polarity. And this type of information is critically important when a controller is managing several parts of a system. It provides the controller with necessary information to make adjustments to switching elements, such as MOSFETs or IGBTs, to optimize system performance and efficiency. And so in the case of an inverter, if you're measuring output currents, you can then adjust the control electronics to make sure that the currents are perfectly optimized to the load and get maximum efficiency of your converter. And so most importantly, though, the magnitude of the current information is used to protect the system from overcurrent situations. So the controller will monitor and measure the voltage and compare that against a number in its lookup table. And if it exceeds that number, then the controller will shut the system down to avoid damage or problems that, uh, that may exist. So, Scott, what are the key metrics we're talking about for shunts? Yeah, so what looks like a pretty simple component as a resistor at a high level, once you look at the details a bit more, it becomes pretty clear that there's a lot going on with the shunt. And so first and foremost, resistance value. Following Ohm's law, a proper resistance value must be chosen. So full-scale voltage is within the system's operating parameters. So the voltage is current times resistance. And you want to make sure that your resistance is chosen such that at full current through any given point in the circuit, the voltage output is manageable and usable by the system so uh, it doesn't create downstream effects or downstream problems. Precision is another critical component to consider. In the case of motor control applications like the one shown below, shunts are used to measure current in each leg of the inverter. If the shunts are not precise or well-matched, improper current information will be fed back to the controller. The controller may think a phase imbalance exists and shut down the system unnecessarily. In the case of the bulk current shunt, a lack of precision may cause nuisance tripping or worse, not signaling the proper current in an overcurrent situation where the system could be subject to damage when the shunt or the resistor is not providing the appropriate telemetry information. Finally, the shunt resistance values exhibit a temperature dependence, TCR, like many electronic components. Our goal as a designer and manufacturer is to choose the best materials that yield the most precise resistance value within the lowest TCR possible. In our imperfect world, TCR exists and is measured in parts per million dependency per degree C. So you do get some drift based on temperature change. And then, of course, temperature rating is another critical component. Since linearity depends on temperature, we have a window to operate in, and our shunts are capable of operating from negative 55C up to 170C. It's really an industry-leading number. And finally, power ratings are important because since power through a shunt resistor is the square of the current, I squared R, power, one must be careful to choose resistance values and power ratings to provide safety margin in the design so you don't overload the shunt or exceed its power rating. So what kind of applications would be a good fit for shunts? Well, in addition to the motor control application noted, one we're seeing that is growing every day and, and expanding are charging stations for EVs. And, you know, a charging station can range anything in size from charging a small scooter or skateboard up to a full, as Tesla launched, the Cybertruck with a 123 kilowatt hour battery. So they can come in many shapes and sizes. And so the shunts have to be chosen in accordance with the power output of the charging system. So in the case of the charging station, shunts are critically important for several factors. Overcurrent protection within the charging system itself. If you have a car you, that gets plugged into the charger and it has a problem on the car or there's a short circuit in the cable, the shunt will report this current information back to the controller so the, the controller can then act accordingly to protect the system from having a, a fault or inducing some sort of other you know, more critical situation. Shunts are important as they calculate charge delivery quantity. 
And so with volts, amps, and time, the kilowatt hour amount is calculated and thus billed accordingly. This is important for the charging station service providers as they want to ensure that their billing is done correctly. And also for billing purposes, having a precise shunt will ensure billing accuracy and regulatory compliance. So it's not unlike a typical gas pump today where the pumps are regulated for accuracy of fuel delivery. It's very similar and the shunts are central to measuring the power delivery from that charging system. So I would also imagine that battery management would be a good application here as well, right? Oh yeah, you're uh, absolutely correct. So battery management come in, just like in charging stations, they come in many shapes and sizes. What we're seeing is a growth in a hybrid grid with large battery energy storage systems and several shunt types are used in these types of systems. Breaking it down to a very, call like the cell level here is shown and making it really simplified. There's two types of shunts used in a battery management system. First is a cell level shunt. These are low current. These are used to report state of charge. The report used to really monitor the cell to cell voltage and also assist in providing information to the battery charge controller with information from the battery to charge and discharge accordingly. This is important because part of the Coulomb counting system that goes in and out of a cell from the battery charge controller. The main bulk shunt for power pack protection is pretty straightforward. It's measuring the amount of current going in and out of the pack. And this telemetry is provided by the shunt and it's used to protect the battery as well as calculate overall charge and discharge quantities. And so, yes, these battery systems are a bit around a long time, but we're now getting to the point where chemistry changes and charging technologies we can charge and discharge them much faster, and having current and telemetry information from shunts is a critical part of the control system in making this happen. In addition, looking at an EV, it is bringing together all of these topologies into one platform, a battery management system, an inverter, as well as a motor control system. And so, the EV example combines these requirements from motor control, charging, battery management, and all the critical considerations mentioned previously apply. But in the case of automotive example, additional qualifications are required to be used on vehicle. This would be the AECQ 200 auto level qualifications. Borns has a full product offering of shunts to address the requirements in this application. All right. So, Let's talk about what Borns brings to the table when it comes to shunts. This is uh, something we're very proud of. We've been making shunts for going on probably a decade or so. And we have factories where we manufacture them in both Costa Rica and in Taiwan. With the acquisition of Redon earlier this year, we now have cladded style shunts as uh, shown on the right hand side of the slide here. And those are mainly used in metering applications and type of industrial applications such as petroleum and protection system for ships and buses and stuff. So it's got a bit of a unique place. The formed welded shunts on the left are much more mainstream. These are board mounted and they're used for many of the applications that we noted earlier. At its heart, the welded shunt is comprised of two materials copper with a resistive material such as manganin as a resistive element. You can see the copper color on the tabs or the ears and then the silverish color in the center which is the resistive element of manganin. And the two are welded together and then formed into different various shapes to achieve desired resistance and power handling capability. Manganin is an alloy material that is mostly copper with the addition of manganese and nickel. The addition of these materials provides good TCR and weldability to copper so you can form it into something that's usable in the circuit and in the system and meet the form factor requirements. And the notch that you see in the resistive element, the manganin, is actually part of the manufacturing process where we notch this portion to fine tune the resistance value across the resistive element. With its arc and its size, we do this to not create hot spots in the material from currents or thermal hot spots. Moving on, here's where we nerd out a little bit. So I'm going to apologize to our audience in advance. The shunt resistor values are a function of material volume, material type, and size. 
just to go through the information above, as the formula notes, given the material constant of 0.38 milliohms per square millimeter, then to achieve a one ohm resistance, you'll need a material thickness of 0.37 millimeters with X and a Y dimension of three millimeters by 3.05. And so it gets into the, a little bit of the details here, but gives you an idea, and, and it's very straightforward. It is more of a volumetric calculation, but the material is important, the material alloy is important, and then how you form it and how you weld it is also affects the shunt precision. Well quality is very important as we join the copper tabs to the manganin Having that weld quality is paramount, and it's difficult because they are dissimilar metals. But having a perfect weld between the copper and the resistance material is critical. Any voids, any errors, any inconsistencies in that weld will create higher levels of resistance and create more work on the back end to fine-tune it or put it out of spec. Some shunts, given the application, they require annealing. And that's actually a heating and a cooling effect that you do to metal to align the metal structure for various purposes. If the design calls for annealing, this process step will alter the material properties as well and thus affect the resistance. This needs to be considered in the design when you have an annealing step. And so these are a couple of points. And finally, if you have sense pins, which you will, where the sense pins are placed is important because that has a direct effect on the measurement precision. And the sense points relative to the welds, relative to the annealing points, bent, et cetera, has to be considered in the design of the shunt. Okay. So, Scott, can you explain that electron beam welding a bit? Yeah. This is uh, where we geek out a little bit on metallurgy and some electronics. And so electron beam welding, it's a fusion welding process where typical welding that we know today is a arc welding, like joining steel that we see in movies and TV. You have two pieces of metal and you develop an arc and you deposit a filler metal and all the metals are the same type. And so it's a very homogeneous process and relatively easy to control. That's on a, like a construction site or if you're welding frames of cars or whatever. An E-beam welding process is a completely different process together. It's a fusion welding process in which a beam of high velocity electrons is applied to the materials to be joined. And so when you have two pieces of material that are dissimilar in metal, such as the pure copper with the alloy of copper, manganese, and nickel, it requires a different welding process. And so in this case, the strips of metal are fed into this E-beam welder under a vacuum. A high energy electron beam is used to melt and fuse the material together. The work pieces melt and flow together as the kinetic energy of the electrons is transformed into heat upon impact. And then E-beam welding is often performed under vacuum conditions, as I mentioned, to prevent the dissipation of the electron beams. It focuses it and makes the weld within like electron level kind of tolerances. And so manganin is 84% copper, about 12% manganese, and about 4% nickel. They're very similar, but not identical enough to be welded in a traditional way. So having this E-beam welding process is critical because what it does is it creates a bulk material for us to then do post-processing on and form the shunts into the finished product that we've seen throughout the presentation. So when you, we feed three strips of material in, two pieces of copper with a resistance material in the middle, we electron beam weld it. It is a roll-to-roll -roll process, as they call it. So the output of this machine is a roll of shunt material, but was started off as three essentially raw materials of copper and manganin. So, Scott, can you walk me through the manufacturing process here? What does that look like? Yeah. As the material leaves the E-beam process, it's in a roll. And these rolls can range from a meter to hundreds of meters long, depending on what you need. And so as it comes into the forming process, it goes through a de-reeling process. So just like on copper wire that we have rolled up, you have to unroll it so it lays flat. And then the de-reeling process flattens the reel of a material and then is fed into the stamping machine, where the stamping machine then forms the shunt, as we know, and it's more of like a little strip piece that is a cross-section or it's a singulated piece off of the roll. 
then once it leaves the stamping process, because it's actually a press with tooling, there's oils involved, we have to clean it and then get it ready for its post-processing testing and finalization. And so then we do a quick pretest on the resistance levels. That gives us a very, very coarse look at the resistance values to make sure that they are within tolerance of the desired spec and the design. This also gives us a feel for the quality of the weld and as well as to make sure that we have a very consistent material batch that has come in. So the pre-testing occurs, it's a resistance value, and then we do a dynamic trim, and then we singulate where we clean up any of the edges and the trim edges and pieces on the shunt. And then we do marking and testing and then packaging. As Borns, we offer some unique options here, which make it a lot easier for customers to bring incoming material into their factory and then implement these shunts into their systems. As we move on to the finishing step, so this is post cleaning and then trimming, then we add a QR code to the shunt. It's laser etched onto the shunt in the case of a metal stamped formed shunt. In that QR code is the manufacturing data. It's the resistance value, day code, lock code, and information. And what we found is our customers really appreciate this because we have the resistance value down to like six or eight decimal points. And this enables them to, as they put this into their system, they feed that information into the algorithms for their controllers so they can easily bring a system up in their factory and put it through final tests and calibrate faster. So it's a real value to the customers that see that the QR code contains this information. But once we mark the part, then we do a visual inspection, do a final test, and then we repackage it and then move it into trays and or other final packaging options, trays and bags for our customers to bring into their factory. Okay, so speaking of packaging, what kind of packaging options do we have here? So looking at the packaging options, we see that some typical shunt configurations here. These are some of our most popular designs and the highest volume runners in terms of these configurations. As you can see, they're E-beam welded, and then they're post-processed with adding mounting holes and the edges are trimmed. The first two designs, the one on the left and the center, they can report currents in the thousands of ampere range. So these are typically used in battery systems, industrial power, EVs, inverters, etc. The shunt on the left shows a through-hole bolt mount style. The holes are formed and stamped as part of the manufacturing process. And this, this is designed to be sent at the mounting point. And these are typically used in battery systems and industrial power some systems that require more precision in the way the current is measured and sensed. And we put vertical pins onto the shunt at very specific locations. More recently, with the advent of battery pack densities and EVs, industrial motor drives, we are seeing the need to form shunts into bus bars. This helps reduce the form factor of the battery system or the inverter system, whatever it may be. And it provides a very tailored solution and optimizes packaging for the application. We do also offer the ability to add a custom connector, like on the shunt in the top right, where the sense location is precisely determined. And we sense there and can provide that information through a PC board with a connector. So it makes interfacing to the shunt very easy so customers can implement this into a variety of applications. All right. So, Scott, this has been a lot to take in today. Can you recap your main points for me? Yeah, sorry. I get a little passionate about shunts. I know it's one of those crazy things in life, but there's such a useful electronic component. So at the end of the day, really what's important when you're selecting a shunt for your system, operating temperature is critical. Our shunts are designed to operate over a very wide temperature range of minus 55 to 170 C. In addition to operating temperature, shunt power rating is very important because the current passing through the shunt has a square effect on the power rating as it's I squared times the resistance, I squared R. And keeping the shunt in an operating temperature where it provides the most precise and linear reading is really what you want in the system. And so by calculating the shunt power level or your resistance, however method you want to do that, you have to take this into consideration. Resistance tolerances are also important and linearity. So over your current range, the voltage that the shunt provides 
as telemetry is within an acceptable tolerance and does not contribute to error in the system. And then form factor. What do you want in your system to look like and how do you want to configure it? This is important, especially in the case of the bus bar application where you can put a shunt in a bus bar where in the past they had to be mounted separately, remotely, et cetera. So form factor has a direct impact on how the shunts are implemented and can give you a better overall product at the end of the day by providing current sense telemetry on the bus bar and without impacting the footprint of the system. And then of course, resistance. Uh, you've got to really choose the resistance level that you need. That goes back to the power rating. So they're all intertwined with each other and they are codependent upon each other. And so these considerations need to be weighed and it's all driven by what the application requires. And finally, integration of the circuit. In the case of the PC board mounted to the shunt from the previous slide, we have the ability to mount a thermistor on that board that provides temperature information as well. So you can have another degree of information coming off the shunt so your control algorithms can measure the power and understand where the shunt is operating in its thermal window. And so the controller needs to calculate the TCR effects of the shunt and provide correction coefficients based on how it's operating. And that's a pretty critical piece there that we offer that you can't find through all shunt vendors. And then also, like I said, mechanical integration, sense pin location, mounting options, bus bar integration. And then for connector configured shunts, we have a standard eight pin connector that we provide. So it, a simple cable can be plugged in to the connector and then that information fed back to the controller on the control board. A lot to think about. It seems pretty straightforward. We're very proud of our shunts and very proud of our technology. And as you can see, we're excited about these types of products. Fantastic. Well, Scott, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you, Amelia. It has been an, an absolute pleasure. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Borns. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.